Hello, everyone. I'm George Hunt, the Executive Director of SAVE, Safety, Agriculture, Villages, and Environment. Welcome to our annual virtual event. This uh, Zoom meeting is being recorded and will be posted on our website. The links which uh, will be discussed by our speakers will also be uh, posted on our website, which is savepa.org. We're excited to have back by popular demand, Tim Stevenson from PennDOT. He will provide an update on projects, transportation projects in District 6, our local area. He will be followed by Brian O'Leary, Executive Director of the Chester County Planning Commission. Brian will discuss county planning, the comprehensive plan, and possibly touch on the grant study, uh, uh, sorry, the study of the Route 41 corridor um, funded by a grants uh, from the county's vision partnership program. And our keynote speaker is Kristen Scudder from the Delaware Valley Regional Planning Commission, DVRPC. She is the manager of uh, freight and uh, she was involved in the drafting of a report released this past July by DVRPC, which the SAVE board thought would be very relevant to our various stakeholders. She will discuss the New Garden Avondale Station, Kennett, uh, possibly some uh, rail freight issues and other concerns. And just a few words about SAVE uh, before we, we begin. Uh, SAVE is a 501c3 nonprofit. We uh, focus on infrastructure issues in Southern Chester County. Our mission is to promote community character and quality of life in this region. We're 26 years old. Our founder, Ricky Saunders, is uh, on the meeting here, which is great. By way of history, many of you are aware of our role in encouraging a two-lane alternative, uh, traffic calmed alternative, to a proposal in the late 90, 1990s, which would have widened Route 41 to four lanes and required a couple bypasses. Uh, philosophically, we are concerned about induced capacity from the widening of traffic lanes. This is akin to water rising to its own level. Uh, in this case, traffic consuming the additional lanes only to require more, creating a vicious cycle of sorts. We do endorse traffic calming measures, uh, which often take the form of roundabouts. While not the solution to every troublesome intersection, they do have safety and cost advantages to signalized intersections, in addition to not requiring electricity. So to advance our mission of uh, promoting quality of life and community character, we advocate smart growth principles. Some examples include preserve open space, direct development to uh, areas where housing density already exists, provide transportation options in these communities. These principles in turn support uh, safe transportation and agricultural preservation which form a nexus between villages and the environment. Our goal, a protected rural countryside with urban center, with vibrant urban centers, which are connected by uncongested scenic roads. Uncongest, pardon me, uncongested being the operative word here. To achieve this goal, we maintain dialogue with residents, elected officials, government agencies, and other experts to support uh, an effective transportation and water infrastructure. We're an all-volunteer organization and residents just like you. So that's it. There will be a Q&A following uh, 
our three speakers. You can submit a, a question through your chat box and possibly raising the hand, hand would work too. Uh, but we encourage participation. And with that, I hand it over to Tim Stevenson. Thank you, George. Uh, so I'm gonna share a screen here and start a presentation. And all right, okay, let's see. There we go, I think I got it going. Can I get a confirmation? Can everybody see my screen quick? Yes. Thank you. All right, so uh, my apologies to everybody. I've been battling through a cold all week and um, I'm still uh, coming out of it and my voice isn't quite right. So uh, when, when I was practicing using the the, the features, uh, the, the the tools that, that are available in, in PowerPoint presentations were telling me I was not getting a proper inflection, but honestly, I could barely talk. So I, <laughs> so my apologies if I'm come off as monotone as, as, as the uh, PowerPoint tools tell me that I did early, anyhow. Uh, so uh, my name is Tim Stevenson. I'm uh, one of the, the district's uh, assistant district executives for design. And, uh, as, as far as PennDOT goes, uh, since we were last together a year ago, there have been some changes to PennDOT's leadership. Uh, uh, the names that are highlighted in bold here on the screen have either uh, you know, been promoted from an acting position or just promoted from other positions in general. Uh, Lou Belmont are, 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 was acting uh, district executive. He's now our district executive. Dean Abazi used to be our district bridge engineer. He's now in charge of maintenance in the district. Uh, Fran Haney, he used to be over overseeing permits, uh, highway occupancy permits, is, is now our uh, ADE for operations. And uh, Gene Blom retired from PennDOT uh, as our legislative affairs director, and, and Brenda Rios has uh, taken over that position. So that's just wanted to give you a quick update on, on, on some changes in leadership at the district office. So uh, PennDOT has a very big program of designing projects in Chester County, uh, as well as the whole five county Philadelphia metropolitan area. Uh, but there are over 300 projects that we're working on in design. Now of those, there are 40 in Chester County that PennDOT is actually designing and leading. There's other ones that are locally run, sponsored, run, but those usually don't show up on this little map that I've got up here. Uh, and th this map is available by, if you're, if you're able to go into PennDOT's website, you can get to a map like this that shows these projects and everything is listed in red. If you were to click on it, it will give you information on the project, such as uh, a project manager, anticipated the dates we'd be going to construction, uh, costs and some other things along that line. Uh, of course, you know, in Chester County, we've got some big quarter projects. Uh, Route one is, is, is of course a, one that's a very large project. It's been broken up into four different sections. The 30 bypass is another corridor project and it's been broken up into four sections or, or more at this point for design. Of course, we've got four different projects on Route 41 and, and then some projects on uh, 896 as well. So uh, <clears throat> why I think you really want to hear from me is mostly to talk about these projects on 41. So I'm going to start at the north of our projects and kind of go to the south as it would be. Uh, the intersection of 41 and 926, I'm, I'm happy to tell you there's been some good developments for this project in the last year. We, we got the permits that we needed to construct the project, finished our right-of-way acquisition, uh, and went through our utility coordination, uh, relo utility relocation coordination so that we'd be able to bid the project. And of course we did. So we received bids uh, on the project earlier uh, this month. Uh, we awarded it to the contractor. It's gonna be J.D. Ekman from Ackland who's gonna be building this project. Uh, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to apologize, George. It will include electricity because we, we are lighting the roundabout as it, as it would be uh, for night. Because it, in, in general, uh, we've found that lit roundabouts, at least at this point, help motorists navigate them as well as make sure that pedestrians are not invisible and, and mistakenly uh, uh, missed. That's not really a, probably a problem here at 926, but when we get to Chatham, that, that could be a problem in other locations, right? So. Uh, we are going to go to construction of this project. Uh, notice proceeds. We're anticipating giving it to the contractor in December. And, and once we go and uh, give the contractor a notice to proceed, we'll start with construction. And, and I will tell you that this roundabout is going to require detours for us to complete. Uh, the first stage of construction uh, for this project is going to be about 130 days long, starting in January. Uh, of which, you know, they, they will, we will be constructing all the roundabout components on what would be the western side of 41. As you might have noticed in the first graphic, you know, we're, we're really shifting the intersection away from its skewed location uh, and, and then making all the approaches kind of coming in at 90 degrees as, as it would be. 
Uh, so we'll be building this new section uh, towards the west or, uh, of, of 41. And when we do that, we actually have to close uh, the 926 approach uh, from the west uh, uh, to the intersection and detour that. And so our detour route is pretty simple for this phase. We just take them up 41 uh, to 796 and then back down to 926. This is the easy part. Now, uh, the next part's gonna be a little bit more difficult. When we get to the second stage of construction, we're gonna actually have to close and detour the whole intersection. So uh, 41 will be closed, 926 will be closed, and the, the detour for 41 is pretty extensive. You see, you see we've got uh, two detour routes actually proposed, one for trucks and one for cars. The one for trucks would take traffic on 41 to Route 1, the whole way down to 10, and then back up Route 10 into Cochranville, uh, back to 41. Whereas the, the vehicular detour is not as dramatic. It's, again, using one, and it's using a, a 796 to, to um, make the movements to complete the detour. The, the 926 detour is a little bit more complicated. Uh, and again, these detours will be signed. Uh, uh, 796 as well um, to get back to the intersection. So uh, come October next year, uh, maybe when you're meeting next year, we'll be able to sit back and, and, and uh, show that we had an open roundabout 141. Uh, the next roundabout or the next intersection that we're working on is, is uh, the intersection of 41 and 841 in the village of Chatham. And uh, we've had some uh, progress on this project. Uh, we've uh, had to, up in the past year, we have updated our purpose and needs for the project. Uh, we get a lot of eyes on our, on our, on our, on our submissions as it would be, and, and we get a lot of comments. And so we you know, respond to comments as it would be. Uh, the big thing is we are indeed looking to finally get our alternatives analysis out to the consulting parties and have a recommended alternative that we'd be looking to advance towards preliminary engineering and then ultimately final design. And of course, on the screen is generally what you're seeing as, as far as recommended alternatives. Everybody's probably seen these alternatives analysis a little bit when we had some public meetings previously. We're finally now at the point where we've you know, documented everything in an alternatives analysis and are, are making a recommendation for what we're going to be doing. So. Uh, in the next year, the next upcoming months, we're going to be holding a Section 106 consulting party after after the people have had an opportunity to review the consulting part, you know, consulting parties have had the opportunity to review the materials that we're sending them next week. It will then eventually lead to the preparation of a determination of effect finding, uh, and then you know we'd be identifying mitigation commitments and then ultimately preparing a memorandum of an agreement. And those are the activities that we'll still be doing in preliminary engineering before we uh, can go into final design uh, for, for the for the project. But again, progress. So uh, uh, if, if you're to look at the little graphic on the, on the bottom of the screen here, uh, where we are is alternative analysis coming up as preliminary design. That could be a two-year process or longer. Final design could be another two-year process and then construction then after that. So uh, progress there. The intersection of uh, US 1 and 41, uh, the, the current design is, is, is for a dumbbell roundabout where, where there would be roundabouts at each of the diamond interchanges. This, this graphic's a little bit dated uh, as it would be, but we don't have a better graphic to, to provide. It generally would look the same. Uh, th this project's ongoing in design, and, and it's actually part of a bigger project that I said previously on Route 1. Uh, it's part of our Route 1 Section 200 project. Uh, where we're going to be reconstructing uh, from uh, west uh, from from west of 896 uh, east you know east I'm sorry east of 896 west of 796 here uh, through the 796 interchange the 841 interchange as well as the 41 interchange and, and as far as this project goes we're in preliminary engineering uh, we did complete the intersection control evaluation for these two interchanges 841 and 441. And, and the roundabouts are proposed for the terminus of the ramps at both of those uh, interchanges. Uh, the intersection of 796, I think we originally identified signals as what we were proposing, but uh, we are now reevaluating that in conjunction with the township's request. Uh, and so we're looking at roundabouts uh, at this location now and, and, and uh, we'll be preparing ICE evaluations to uh, document what would be appropriate for that, right? So uh, again, we'll be doing that activities and then we'll continuing to advance section 106 coordination and, and completing preliminary design. Uh, as you proceed south, you get into Avondale. Uh, we have an intersection improvement project at 41 and State Road and First Avenue. Uh, this project's been pretty much kind of stalled as it would be because we had a long uh, conversation with the museum commission 
as to what was the boundaries and components of the Avondale Historic District. Uh, we were unable to come to agreement, so uh, PennDOT decided to concede to what the Museum Commission said was the recommended Avondale Historic District. Uh, so we, we're done now with, with the, discussing what is or is not eligible. We are conceding to what the Museum Commission has said. So our next work for this intersection is going to be developing the purpose and needs for the project, uh, as well as then starting Section 106 consulting parties and the preparation of alternatives analysis. So basically the boundary that anybody would have known from a long time ago for Avondale Borough, that those are still the boundaries of the Avondale Historic District. The only change really winds up being related to the bridge uh, at 41. Previously, that, that uh, documentation did not include the bridge as being a component within the district. It's the Museum Commission's uh, position that the bridge does contribute to the district. So now the bridge is identified as, as contributing to the, to the district. And of course, I, I did wanna bring up the bridge here because everybody may know uh, the, the, the bridge uh, over uh, White Clay Creek will soon be posted with weight restrictions. Now, the, the 27 ton, 40 ton combination load, a combination load would be like a tractor trailer or anything that's pulling a trailer is a combination load. Uh, so it's going to be posted with weight restrictions shortly. Uh, the bridge is inspected on a six month cycle. And, and I would tell you that, you know, Although we're posting it now, conditions really haven't changed in the last six months. What what has changed is PennDOT's policy uh, related to how we want to protect uh, deteriorated beams. If you've been out, if you've driven through uh, across the bridge, you, you would know we've got delineators, uh, little uh, plastic delineators on the side of the bridge to kind of keep trucks and, and traffic off of the uh, towards the, the sidewalk areas. Uh, that we've determined that that kind of uh, protection isn't robust enough and, and our policy has changed and we need to put concrete barriers on it. And in fact, it's the, because we're adding the weight of these concrete barriers that we're, that is getting us to putting a, a weight restriction on the bridge. Uh, now, the, the thing about the, the posting that's going to be going up is that it will still allow for tractor trailers to use the bridge. Tractor trailers are usually 40 ton combination vehicles, so they wouldn't be precluded from using the bridge. There are vehicles that would be. Uh, we have reached out to say the the, the Avondale Fire Company uh, or the local fire companies and, and, and we'll be getting them uh, permits that they can continue to use the bridge. Uh, you know, just because something is weight restricted with a posting doesn't mean that it's not safe for use, but we do wanna look at those uh, those locations determine how many vehicles will be using it. Uh, and, and then of course, make sure if there's an issue that we'd want them directed to, to, to cross the bridge, say in the mi middle or interior, that we could do that. And, and again, this, this, this picture you see on the screen, it kind of shows the, the extent of this bad beam that we've got concerns with. Uh, there's a bad beam like this on both sides of the bridge. It, it's, it's, it's about uh, where the shoulder ends. And so when you see the barriers go up, the barriers will probably go up on the top side somewhere at this point, again, to keep people off of, off of what would be uh, the bad beam. So where were we at with that project, right? Um, so again, the, 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 we have a project to uh, rehab or, or to replace that bridge. Uh, we, uh, again, in the past year, we've conceded to the Museum Commission's uh, boundaries on the historic district and the bridge contributing to the district. So uh, what we've done is we've all developed the purpose and needs for the project. Uh, and if anybody wants to see the purpose and needs, you can go to our project website for the project. Uh, and that upcoming work will be uh, starting the early notification on PATH. And then we're, we're starting to prepare a rehabilitation uh, feasibility analysis or rehabilitation analysis to see whether rehabilitation of the bridge will meet the purpose and needs for the project or whether we need to proceed with the replacement. Uh, that is all that I've got, George, so I will stop here. But if anybody has any questions, again, i got our website right here, pa41.com. Great. Uh, thank you. I, I'm back on. Uh, uh, that was an alarming photograph. Thank you, Tim. I think we've got a couple questions pertaining to that. Uh, for now, let's have Brian O'Leary from the Chester County Planning Commission. All right, thank you, uh, George. Let me get my presentation up and running, just a second. All right, so uh, hopefully you can all see this and hear me fine. Um, well, I, I, I can't match Tim's presentation, so pretty, pretty, pretty interesting stuff there. 
Uh, but what I'm going to do is just talk a little bit about what we have going on in Southern Chester County uh, here at the Planning Commission. Just going to highlight a couple of things. And the first is that um, we've been doing this municipal outreach initiative where we're we're contacting municipalities on very specific issues and generally contacting most municipalities in the county about things they may want to consider. Uh, one is uh, open space, which is in every county municipality, an analysis of how much open space they have preserved, where are uh, opportunities for additional preservation, and tools they may want to consider for their open space preservation. Uh, we're, we'll soon be sending out something on solar ordinances and things they may want to consider. Uh, we have a lot of communities. Most don't really have any solar regs. We actually recommend having regulations for solar and trying to make it uh, possible to develop solar while also uh, making sure that you um, meet local community needs. Uh, we did some outreach on natural resources. Uh, a lot of Southern Chester County communities are pretty strong in those regulations, uh, but we did send out to every municipality about things that may want to consider about woodlands and wetlands, steep slope, and other type of uh, natural resource protection. Our housing has gotten too expensive. Uh, we just had a session this afternoon, and we've reached out to what we uh, what, on what we call the Starter Home Initiative to see if local communities are interested in trying to address and provide more affordable housing. And we're doing some analysis of uh, some communities in Southern Chester County on that issue. Uh, our more agriculturally focused communities, we've done some outreach about what they specifically might want to change in their regulations to make them a little ag friendlier things such as build ag into your uh, permitted uses and into the intent of your ordinance, allow farmers to do some secondary uses, uh, allow some ag on on your on your farms. And then on the transportation front, uh, we did an outreach on active transportation. What are community, what can communities do to encourage more pedestrian and bicycling and use of transit? And related to that, a complete streets policy the county adopted. Uh, Ten uh, county municipalities have also adopted that. And the complete streets is really about um, traffic calming and making sure streets can be used by everyone. Wanted to highlight our uh, municipal corner. I may have touched on this last year, but uh, we do have an area for those of you involved with local municipalities with a lot of tools. And specifically, um, want to highlight our planning e-tools. I'm frozen, so I'm going to get out of this for a second. And let me reshare. That didn't work, so let me try a different tact here. I won't go into the um, complete screen view since I was having troubles with that, but uh, one thing I wanted to highlight is our planning e-tools. We have about 90 of these. I touched on a lot of topics. Uh, here is an example on accessory dwelling units. And then uh, George had asked that I touched on uh, some of the projects happening in Southern Chester County. So these shaded areas on the map are all the different vision partnership program projects, planning projects going on in uh, Chester County. And you can see Southern Chester County has a lot of projects uh, that are active now. And just moving from east to west, we're finishing up Brandywine Battlefield uh, plan. That's something we're working on. We have a number of communities that are just starting up on a Harriet Tubman Heritage Interpretation Plan in Pensbury, Pocopson, Kennett area. 
Uh, then we have a Mason-Dixon line study going on, New Garden, L London, Britain, Franklin, and Elk. Uh, the Oxford Region Comprehensive Plan is uh, happening on the uh, further west. And uh, then a important one for you guys is the Route 41 corridor improvement study, and that is cutting through Kennet, New Garden, London Grove, and Londonderry. Of course, it also affects Avondale quite a bit. And that study is uh, moving forward, maybe not quite as fast as we all expected. And it looks like probably the public meeting on that won't be until early next year. Um, another regional thing going on in Newland, West Marlboro and East Marlboro is a joint uh, comprehensive plan update. Individual things are Oxford uh, is wrapping up a comprehensive plan update, West Grove some zoning ordinances, and Penn's doing a comprehensive plan also. So you can see there's a lot of planning activity going on uh, in, in your neck of the woods. Finally, I just wanted to highlight that uh, the county has an America 250 PA commission. Uh, this is the web page. Uh, it's really getting up and running. In addition, we're doing a heritage tourism uh, uh, plan. And this is really an opportunity for everyone to coordinate with each other and with the county on what we're all going to do to commemorate the nation's 250th birthday. So uh, this page I'm showing here is an opportunity to become a partner to pledge. So I encourage you to get involved. Save itself could be a partner, but also certainly uh, any municipalities or other related organizations uh, might want to partner with us. And finally, here's my contact information. And of course, I'll be uh, staying on to uh, answer any questions later on. So thanks once again for having me. And I'm looking forward to uh, hearing Kristen's presentation. Great. Th thank you, Brian. And the, your website is really uh, quite informative and easy to navigate. Uh, and now for our keynote speaker, uh, Kristen Scudder, freight manager from the DVRPC. Uh, on to you, Kristen. Sorry about that. Let me get my screen sharing going. All right. Can you all hear and see my presentation? Okay. Yes. Fantastic. Um, well, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for, for having me here to share with you all this evening. Um, uh, like George said, my name is Kristen Scudder. I am the Freight Program Manager at DVRPC. Um, and this evening, I thought I would highlight some of the freight planning efforts that we have been working on over the past five-ish years in Southern Chester County um, in conjunction with the, the County Planning Commission as well. But first, I wanted to start by just giving a little bit of background on DVRPC for those who may not be familiar. Um, DVRPC is the Delaware Valley Regional Planning Commission. We are the federally designated metropolitan planning organization for the nine county regions surrounding Philadelphia and including Philadelphia. Um, so we work with five counties on the Pennsylvania side of the river and four counties on the New Jersey side of the river. And primarily, we act as an advisory agency. Um, we work with our partners at state, county, and municipal levels um, to create a vision for the region. And right now, that, that vision is to create a region that is prosperous, um, innovative, equitable, resilient, and sustainable. So as, a, as an agency, we aim to achieve this by convening a wide array of partners to inform and facilitate data-driven decision-making. And we reflect that in our freight program as well. So the, the freight program specifically, um, myself and, and my team, we, we work to promote freight considerations across the planning process um, and, and specifically to make sure and, and encourage the development of safe and efficient multimodal transportation systems across the region. 
Um, and one of the ways that we aim to do this is through planning studies that we conduct with our municipal and county partners. So in recent years, we have been fortunate enough to conduct two studies in Chester County. Um, the first being the Kennett Area Freight Transportation Study. This was a more localized um, project that looked at freight movements in the Kennett area and specifically around the mushroom industry um, and their activities. And then the Chester County Freight Plan, which George alluded to, um, where we looked at freight activity at a countywide level and established goals for freight planning that align with the Planning Commission's Landscape 3 Comprehensive Plan and the vision that was set forth there. Both of these plans really highlight though, um, how valuable the freight transportation system is to Chester County. Um, it's really an asset and it supports vital components of the county economy um, and the county identity. So, you know, both of these efforts have really um, strived to, to show that the value in understanding freight activity and planning for it helps to support, you know, the businesses um, and communities that are vital to maintaining that safe, efficient uh, transportation infrastructure that, that the county wants. So as it relates to you know, this, this group in particular, uh, I wanted to focus a little bit more on the Route 41 corridor um, and, and the Kennett area study, share a little bit of background on that. Um, this study was conducted in 2018 and 2019, so it's a few years old at this point. Um, and it focused on understanding the agricultural industry, but specifically the mushroom industry, like I mentioned, with, with the goal of providing recommendations that really focused on balancing the movement of both people and goods and providing um, recommendations for improvements that could support that. So the, the study looked at six municipalities in total, um, the boroughs of Kennett Square and Avondale, and then the townships of Kennett, New Garden, East Marlboro and uh, London Grove, um, with a specific focus on road geometric constraints, bridge restrictions, and truck routing in the area. And in this study, we worked to we looked at identifying all of the industrial and commercial establishments in the area. Um, so what you see on this map here are all of those industrial establishments with some of the larger mushroom and agricultural facilities pointed out. Um, and all the green dots across the region are the grow houses in the area. Um, so what we see is a very obvious clustering of these, especially around the Kennett Square area and Avondale boroughs. Um, and so this gave us a, a focus area to work with um, for some of the recommendations of, of the study. Through our outreach to our industrial and agricultural partners, you know, we mapped out this mushroom supply chain um, to better understand and document how trucks were moving between the different facilities um, in, in the area. And there are a lot of trucks that are bringing supplies to and from um, the mushroom grow houses in particular. But what we found interesting was that the larger tractor trailers, um, specifically those that were being called out by a lot of our community outreach, um, were really mostly being used to move to and from processing facilities and packing facilities. Um, again, this allowed us to kind of highlight some of those larger facilities that I showed on the map before um, as those that needed consideration for access for some of these trucks that support their, their business. So. In addition to kind of talking to the industrial and agricultural partners, um, we did an extensive outreach to uh, residents in the community using a web map portal um, that allowed folks to pinpoint areas of concern and add comments about what their concern was. And there were a couple of highlights that came out of that um, that you see here. These, these were far and beyond kind of the, the top comments that we saw multiple times coming, coming up. Um, the first being, you know, a concern for some of these larger trucks on narrow rural roads, um, mostly because they often have to leave their lane to navigate some of the, the winding turns. Um, a lot of concerns and conversations around the intersection of state and Union Streets in, in the Kennett Square borough. 
um, trucks trying to make an illegal right-hand turn, traveling south on Union to turn on state, um, and, that, and that movement detracting from, you know, the aesthetics, the feel um, of that intersection and the main street right there, um, as well as causing property damage to the curb, um, slowing traffic, blocking traffic when they have to make a multi-point turn. Um, and then general safety concerns were heard around truck activity in school zones, um, concerns around truck volumes and traffic speed specifically on Route 41, um, and then a desire for pedestrian facilities, especially in some of the Main Street and borough areas. So these were kind of, you know, what we heard from the community in terms of what they wanted. So we took all of that outreach input, um, as well as the evaluation of freight activity, um, and then this map, which shows crash locations, and we identified three focus areas where the recommendations of this study were really meant to be implemented. Um, so we have, um, you know, Kennett Square and then two locations on Route 41. And, and these were the focus of our report recommendations. So this report, um, again, a couple, a couple years old at this point, um, the recommendations were to lean into implementing traffic calming strategies, especially on some of the heavier trafficked truck routes, um, designating a local truck route network, something that could be used to better plan um, and plan for truck activity in the area um, and, and make more informed investment decisions. And then improving wayfinding and directional signage. Um, so I'll go into a couple of, of the more specific recommendations around these. Uh, when it comes to traffic calming, um, you know, this report was recommending overhead speed displays and median gateways. Um, these are tools that we already see in certain areas across the region, um, but can be very effective. And as Tim just uh, gave us an overview of, I think since this report has come out, um, all of these roundabout uh, projects have have taken off. So that's an even uh, even bigger and potentially more effective way to provide traffic calming on on some of these uh, routes, specifically Route 41. And then, in addition to you know trying to slow down traffic, providing improved um, crossing locations for pedestrians, specifically um, in some of the denser main street areas. Um, providing high visibility crosswalks, which are the, um, you know, the wider white strips that you see in this photo here that make it much easier for vehicles to see on the road where the crossing is. Um, and then flashing beacons to, to indicate uh, with light, you know, where pedestrians might be crossing the road. And then the third recommendation that, uh, that I mentioned was improving wayfinding for trucks. So one of the major concerns we heard in this study was at this intersection of, of Union and State Street um, and the need to kind of provide better wayfinding options for trucks to, to navigate the, the green route seen here, which is the designated truck route. And uh, you might be able to see from these photos here, but what we really saw was there was a lot of conflicting and confusing signage. Um, and a lot of signage that told drivers what not to do, but not super clear signage that told drivers what they should be doing. Um, so the recommendations that came from the study were to provide um, more advanced notice so that drivers had uh, noticed that they needed to make a decision before they actually got to the intersection and then clear signage at the decision point that showed them where they needed to go. And, since this study has been released, these changes have actually been implemented. So what we can see here um, is very clear signage um, that has a consistency amongst all the signs that show where this truck route is. Um, so advanced signage, signage at the decision points um, that point trucks to, to make this path to, to get onto State Street. So um, uh, a success story, I suppose, of, of recommendations turning into action right there. And then the last large recommendation that came from this report was to designate a, a truck route network for planning purposes. Um, and I'm going to hold off on going on into that a little bit more, and I'll talk about it later um, in, in my presentation. So 
the Kennett was the Kennett report was a, a much more localized uh, report, you know, looking at uh, at a couple of communities. But more recently, we've been working with the Planning Commission on a Chester County freight plan. Um, this was published over the summer. And it really came out of an action item from the Landscapes 3 comprehensive plan, um, specifically from the Connect goal, which focuses on transportation. And the, the goal um, listed in Landscapes 3, but the, the origin of the study was really an acknowledgement that the county's road and rail networks are critical, not only to the local economy um, and the local movement of goods, but also to our regional movement of goods. Um, Chester's really close to uh, a few ports in the area, um, as well as the international movement of goods. So while this movement can be really positive for local municipalities, for the county, um, it can also come with some unintended consequences. So being able to plan for those freight movements is, was really important to the county. So, so that's where the study came out of. Um, and the first step really, uh, same with the Kennett study and something that we try to use regionally is to start by identifying what is freight in Chester County? What does it look like and, and how do we know where it is? Um, so for planning purposes, we tend to separate freight activity into two main categories, consumption industries and freight intensive industries. And when I say consumption industries, uh, you know, I really mean things like offices, hospitals, schools. Um, these are these are industries that rely on freight. They rely on deliveries. Um, but they're not a large um, generator of, of those trips. While freight intensive industries are, are those where we see more concentrated freight activity, typically higher volumes, larger vehicles. Um, and, and within that category, we can break down freight activity into, into three subcategories. Um, extraction being industries like mining and agriculture, um, production being industries like manufacturing, uh, and distribution industries like warehousing um, and, and forwarding. So we took kind of those categories uh, to take a closer look at what are the freight intensive industries across the county and what is their impact in terms of GDP and in terms of um, items that they're moving um, and modes that they're using. What, what is the primary transportation mode for these industries? And uh, you can see the list here. I, I won't read all the details, but um, you know the seven top kind of freight intensive industries that were identified were agriculture, construction, manufacturing, mining and quarrying, transportation, utilities, and wholesale trade. Um, and a few takeaways overall from kind of this uh, conglomerate of, of industries is that a majority of the goods across the board are moved by truck and likely we expect will remain that way. Um, but there is a fair amount of rail activity that is being used in the county. Um, and given the limited amount of right of way in the county, um, this is still something that is highly relied on by, by a few industries, especially in the movement of, of bulk commodities. Um, so a really important part of the freight network that supports, you know, supports these industries. And then lastly, um, if you look at all of these industries together, they account for around 22% of the total county GDP. Um, so this is a significant group and an important part of the county economy um, that really relies on the transportation infrastructure. So these industries rely on the networks that the county provides. And at a glance, we can see that the infrastructure is pretty extensive. Um, in Chester County alone, there are 26 miles of federally designated interstate routes, um, 160 miles of the National Highway Network, um, 108 miles of freight rail trackage, and five rail yards and intermodal terminals. Um, and these are all part of, of what supports these industries. However, knowing that a majority of, of these uh, freight generating industries really rely on truck movements. We took a closer look at the truck volumes on the major roads across the county. Um, and you can see from this map here, it, it paints a picture um, of daily truck volume on some of the roads in the county. 
Um, and the orange and red roads are where we see those higher volumes of truck traffic. Now, you'll notice that most of those roads are um, limited access highways, the major roads that run through Chester County, um, which is to be expected. These roads hold higher volumes of traffic in general, so naturally they also hold higher volumes of truck traffic. But we can use this to see that, that these are what supports the freight network, um, and this is where uh, investment and consideration needs to be focused. But a different way that we were also able to evaluate truck movements in the county um, was looking beyond just volumes on individual roads and really trying to look at the actual trip paths that trucks are taking. Um, so what you see in these two maps here um, are a display of actual truck trips that are gathered from GPS trace data, um, GPS that is in, um, in the trucks. And uh, it's a sample of data. It's about a four week period. And we've split these trips into heavy truck trips, which are more of your tractor trailers, semi trucks and medium truck trips, which are smaller box trucks, straight trucks. Um, and a very clear pattern uh, emerges from, from the display of these trips. And we can see that you know heavy truck trips are much more likely to use the major highways and roads in the county um, and coming off really only to access their destinations while medium and smaller trucks are much more dispersed across the road network um, and use more of the minor roads. Uh, again, this gives us a clearer picture of where um, considerations need to be made, especially for larger trucks to access facilities, um, and where we generally see more smaller trucks utilizing the, the road network. Now, how can we take all of this information, truck volumes, truck paths, major industries, employment, um, and zoom in on a more nuanced level um, without the ability to kind of do a, a Kennett area freight study for every, uh, you know, every neighborhood and community across the county. Um, we used what we call freight planning centers to, to zoom in and take a closer look at, at truck activity across the county. Um, and so when I say freight planning centers, um, this is a... Um, it's a designation that DVRPC um, created back in 2017, and it used data at the time to identify concentrations of freight activity across the region. And these designations, they, they don't have any uh, business incentives behind them, or uh, you know, there's not a formal designation, you would never see a sign out on the road. These are exclusively a planning tool. So we use these to understand and be able to kind of map out where these concentrations of freight development, jobs, and transportation activity are. So in Chester County, uh, there are seven of these freight centers, um, and collectively they employ around 12,000 people um, and range from clusters of local manufacturing facilities, um, some heavy manufacturing, heavy industrial in Coatesville, um, to high-tech manufacturing. And while these, uh, we also recognize that these planning centers are not the only source of freight activity in the region. Um, so as a part of the plan, we also looked at more recent industrial development in the county um, and generally saw that new development was ha happening near and around these freight centers, starting to push some of the boundaries, you know, a little expansion. Um, but there were also some potential new clusters of activity. Um, and one of the most prominent um, is the proposal for uh, 1.9 million, I believe, square feet of proposed development near the interchange of the Turnpike and, and Route 100. Um, so that is a, a, an area of future freight activity that you know, we think should be uh, on the radar. Um, but for the purposes of looking at existing traffic, um, we focused on, on these centers. So. I won't go into detail about all of these centers, and I think today the most appropriate would be to look at our Avondale New Garden Freight Center um, and just give you all an idea of, you know, what information is in the plan regarding, um, regarding this area. 
So this freight center profile um, on the map, uh, the areas shown in blue are, are what are technically considered the freight center, um, spans both uh, Avondale and New Garden. Um, and by looking at the same GPS trace data that I showed you, the, the bright pink and, and blue maps, um, we were able to get a better understanding of where trips that were accessing this center in particular were originating from. And so the orange points on the map show you um, the percentage of the trips that are accessing this freight center, um, which roads they're utilizing. And maybe to surprise, maybe no surprise, uh, there's about 70% of truck trips in our data set that we're using Route 41 to access facilities in this area. Um, the, the second highest um, entry gate, if you will, for these, you know, these truck trips was on Baltimore Pike. Um, so these profiles were created with the hopes that this data might provide municipalities with a little more detail to better understand some of these access points. Um, and a better understanding of, you know, not just where the truck volumes are, but the paths that they're taking to get there. Um, similarly, uh, you can see from the graph, uh, a majority of the trips that are accessing this freight center um, consist of heavy trucks, semi-trailers, truck trailers, um, while only about 40% are, are medium trucks. Um, I will put a small asterisk and caveat next to this. Um, you know, these are sample data sets. They are not uh, um, all inclusive but we feel that they're pretty representative um, and, and paint a good enough picture for us to get a, a good understanding of what the activity is. So the second phase of, of the freight plan after kind of documenting a profile for the county was to create a freight action plan. Um, so we took all of the public outreach comments into consideration to identify um, you know, freight issues that were important to, to the community. Um, we use that, the freight profile data collection with our steering committee to come up with six goals um, for the action plan that are aligned with existing county priorities and previous plans, um, and especially the priorities that are established in the comprehensive plan. So these six goals um, include supporting and implementing freight safety improvements and initiatives, um, increasing the efficiency of goods movement and maintaining reliable mobility for trucks, um, promoting education about freight that supports vital industries and county identity, and supporting industrial redevelopment opportunities that preserve open space, um, encouraging new technologies and infrastructure investment that offer more sustainable options for freight transportation, supporting industrial redevelopment opportunities and infrastructure for economic growth, and then lastly, and very importantly, coordinating with communities to ensure that mobility for trucks is also consistent with their local and regional priorities. So these six goals are, um, are high level and to accompany them, our steering committee came up with a list of action strategies. And these strategies correspond to multiple goals across the plan. Um, but really help to provide strategies and recommendations for future freight planning efforts um, and how they can be incorporated into existing transportation and, and, and planning efforts. So given that there are 13, I won't go into all of them today. I wanted to point out a couple of them to you all. Um, the first being to, to designate a primary truck route network. Um, in a minute, I will go into more detail about some of the process behind the, and the value behind designating a network, understanding where trucks are moving. And since I already spent a little bit of time talking about kind of traffic calming complete streets recommendations with the, the Kennett report, um, a lot of the recommendations in here are very similar. So instead I'd like to focus on three of the action strategies that specifically we felt um, support preservation and identity within the county. Um, and the first of those was to encourage concentrated industrial development in and around existing freight centers. Um, and, and this really uh, detailed and in promoting industrial infill development and redevelopment 
at, at vacant or underutilized sites um, near existing freight tr transportation infrastructure. Um, concentrating this freight activity in areas that are already well positioned to support freight intensive industry can help to uh, reduce sprawl and reduce the need for investment in additional infrastructure just to support new development. Um, given that there are some of these centers, many of these centers already in the county, um, this was seen as an opportunity to, to encourage that. Um, the second was to preserve freight rail access. And a lot of the goals in these strategies were similar um, by promoting and preserving freight rail access um, as a sustainable mode of transportation. Um, it, it also uh, provides the opportunity to um, identify opportunities to um, increase industrial business access to rail. So this may include supporting investment in the maintenance of existing track um, that can help to support existing and efficient freight movement for businesses that rail is already serving. Um, and preserving rail access could also attract new rail served industry to the area, again, in kind of a concentrated industrial area. And then lastly, um, the strategy of promoting freight education. Um, generally, uh, we find that a lot of the barriers around successfully um, discussing and planning for freight really come from a lack of education around why is freight in my communities? Um, so one of the strategies for this plan was to really find opportunities to continue to promote freight education about the role and importance of goods movement in the community, um, how it plays an important role in prominent industries like agriculture and manufacturing that are vital to the county um, identity and the county economy. So for those that are interested, there is a more extensive and detailed list on, on all of these action strategies in the report. And I wanted to end on um, the uh, one of the strategies we were able to take kind of a step further um, and start identifying potential routes that could be considered as a part of a freight planning network. Um, so what you see highlighted in this map here are the routes that we know are already holding significant amounts of freight traffic and our primary and higher level highways and roads that are supporting the freight centers in the county. Um, so, so this was provided as a starting point. Um, it is a, a draft form at best, um, but the hopes of providing something that identifies where this freight activity is as a starting point for planning further. Lastly, uh, in order to implement all of these strategies, we provided a list of funding opportunities and some examples for how these funding sources might be able to further um, not only additional planning uh, and more localized planning, but um, some you know, construction and, and build out as well. So I will, I will end there. Uh, thank you all so much for your time. Uh, if you're interested in more uh, information on these reports, they're both available on our DVRPC website and, and both of the links are here. I think that Jess might be able to share them in the chat as well if she hasn't already. So thank you all so much. Great. Thank you, thank you Kristen. Uh, that was fascinating. And we will also uh, post links. We have uh, a few questions. I will start with a quick follow-up oh. for you, Kristen. You mentioned that you provide, DVRPC provides a service where you put together data analysis and recommendations provide them to the municipalities. What is the protocol? Do the, are the municipalities, can they take it or leave it? Um, or do they give a, a response? Uh, how does that work? Sorry, my speakers were, were not working for the first part of your question. Um, are you referring specifically to this, like these studies in particular? Yes, yeah, so for, for instance, you were um, saying how uh, analyzing the data of freight traffic, you then, um, came up with uh, uh, an action plan recommendations that you provide to municipalities and what's the protocol for their response or or lack thereof? So everything that's in the plan is, is a recommendation, um, more of a tool that is available for municipalities to take advantage of. Um, 
but not something that is required by any means. So, so follow-up is, is not required as a part of this. Um, it is more intended as uh, an opportunity for, for those that are interested in, in using it. Great, thank you. And uh, he, uh, another question, just to follow up, Tim, with uh, your uh, discussion of the bridge in Avondale, we received an email uh, question uh, expressing great concern about not only it's, it's the corrosion, but the potential impact of rerouting of traffic and um, could you uh, give insights into what that might be? And Kristen, could you follow up? Sure, I'll, I'll start then. Uh, so with the posting for the bridge, uh, we will be signing a, a truck detour route. Uh, uh, it, it's more called an alternate truck route as it would be. Uh, the vehicles, I'm not sure exactly how many vehicles will actually have to detour around the bridge. Uh, like I said, uh, tractor trailers will still be able to utilize the bridge. Usually anything that has a trailer uh, would be considered a combination load and say 40 tons is really the the, the weight limit that, that's like the high bar uh, limit. Anything beyond that needs a special hauling permit or a, a heavy load, you know, a super load as we call them, right? So I, I, there, there may be some challenges for, for, for uh, single, you know, for, for, for like trucks, like dump trucks and things along that line. And if they're loaded, those might need to use different roads. But again, they can come to us for permits for, for use of the bridge and uh, we'd review those uh, so that they wouldn't necessarily tour. We issue permits for uh, bridges uh, that are posted with weight restrictions uh, frequently. Again, it's, it's, it's so that we've got record of the vehicles that are using the bridge and we're aware of it. Thank you, Anchor. George, I'm not sure I have anything else to add to that. I think Tim summed it up perfectly. You know, those are those are the repercussions that that can happen, but uh, most vehicles are going to be able to use this. And uh, to Tim's point, vehicles like trash trucks that might need to get those permits, they tend to be local vehicles, um, and that means that they can normally get those a little bit easier than than vehicles that are traveling either through or from out of the area. Okay, a, a, a follow-up um, uh, in chat here. Are there any plans, uh, not pertaining to the bridge, but to reduce the volume of trash trucks that navigate roads? And this person says on um, my street, nine houses are serviced by three different trash companies, uh, some of which send separate trucks for trash and recycle pickup which I think resonates with all of us. Um, Tim, could you start? Um, Brian, perhaps mention if this is a comprehensive plan. Uh, well, I, I would say from just my own experience, uh, where I live in West Brandywine Township, I have the benefit of our township actually contracting trash and recycling services for the whole community. Uh, so uh, I pay an annual bill to to the township who then pays it to the vendor they've hired. And we don't have that. So we'll, we'll have one trash truck that kind of comes through uh, like today. Uh, and, you know, and then another one would follow through with the recycling. So that really winds up being a municipal thing. Uh, there, I mean, there are municipalities that actually perform the trash hauling uh, and, and removal like in, in Delaware County. Uh, so it, 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 that, that really winds up being a municipal uh, item for consideration. Yeah, Tim, Tim, spot on. It's really if the municipality can make a decision that they just want to have one uh, hauler and then they can they can do that if they would like. Uh, thank you. Um, why don't uh, for Kristen, this is from a, a save board member. What are the major impediments to moving more freight out of the port of Wilmington by rail rather than truck? It depends on what the freight is that's coming in through the ports and, and where it's going. Um, I think that generally the largest impediment is probably that it tends to be cheaper and often faster to move things via truck 
And that's why we see certain commodities moving by rail more often than others, like bulk commodities. Um, so as imports into the port grow or change, uh, it's really going to depend on what they are and if rail kind of fits that bill or if they're commodities that people are expecting to move very quickly. Uh, Brian, is there in a comprehensive plan, is there any um, sort of di dictate about uh, freight and uh, in increasing its usage or? No, what we're really, you know, it's an economic uh, issue that goes beyond what a county or local municipalities can do. So in the comp plans, we're re really trying to get freight generators on either end in the right locations through land use policy. And then for freight that's moving through to try to ameliorate the impacts of the freight. And that's really what happens at the local or the county level. Um, but it is an economic driver to, uh, it's really what's driving freight. And Tim, you probably, um, since you're so focused on roadway transportation, uh, do you have an opinion on freight as an alternative? And, and no, and I, and I see there's been some more questions in chat that are kind of similar as it would be. Um, I mean, what what we observe is, is that uh, you know the, the people that move freight uh, are, are most interested in being able to move their freight efficiently for the lowest cost possible, right? So if that winds up being via, uh, they can do it via rail, they will do it via rail. And rail usually winds up being a very cheap and effective way, but it all depends upon the goods that are needing to get moved and where it's headed, right? So uh, it's it's really a function of uh, of those uh, of the supply chain and, and how how products are moved and and usually the people that are involved in that uh, in the transportation logistics are indeed looking at the efficiencies foremost. <laughs> well, um, and for, for all of you, one resident here notes something that uh, I think we all do, which is that the mushroom industry is is part of the character and it's and um uh it's um important economically um but it, it's a freight uh burden uh in the area and i mean how much of a pr priority is it to uh, somehow reduce that and you know leave transfer some of it to freight for instance i'll start with um kristen so the the challenge in in moving it to rail right is is, is like tim was was just saying uh perishable goods tend to not travel well by rail um however there are um certain inputs into the mushroom process, uh, like substrate compost, those types of things that don't always move by rail, but I think do occasionally, um, as well as the packaging that is used to, to package mushrooms at the end of the day. So there are opportunities for portions of the supply chain to sometimes utilize something other than trucks. Um, as for reducing the amount of truck traffic that is generated by the mushroom industry. I can't speak to any current plans right now that the county or any of the um, businesses have to, to change those operations. Thank you. And you, while, while you're on the hot seat, Kristen, here's both a sort of question and comment. Is there any joint planning to occur with Lancaster County. And maybe Brian, you can touch on this. Much Route 41 traffic goes between Delaware and Lancaster County on Route 41. Question and question for Mr. Stevenson of PennDOT, please confirm that the traffic, uh, I'll, do, I'll do this second. So may, maybe we can just talk about, is there joint planning and um, uh, any thoughts on that? I'm going to pass this one off to Brian with the current uh, Route 41 project. But before I pass it off, uh, 
I just, after this question, it looks like Ricky might have a question as well to ask. Um, so maybe we can get to that next. Once, wonderful. Certainly we coordinate with Langster on a variety of issues, uh, but not the not the Route 41 at the moment. So that study is kind of the lower half of Route 41 through the county. Um, so it's an issue in general. It's trying to, you know, at the edges of the county or the region is to make sure that we are talking. And so I know PennDOT, I'm sure, talks across across the region. We certainly do with our neighbors. And I know DVRBC has meetings with the uh, neighboring uh, metropolitan planning organizations, but nothing specific on Route 41. Great. And before we get to Ricky, uh, Tim, for you, um, pl please confirm that the traffic circles at Route 41 and 926 and others will have separate crossings and or markings intended for safe passage by pedestrians, bike, bicyclists, e-bikes, e et cetera, and will be uh, also be needed at the circles to, de to be de designed at the intersection of uh, Limestone Road, um, Route 7 in New Garden. Let, let me jump in and quickly, I guess, share my screen for a moment uh, that, where I've got an image of the uh, proposed pavement markings uh, for the intersection of uh, the, new, the new roundabout at uh, 41 and uh, 926. Give me one moment here to share that. Share screen. There we go. So, so he, um, I got probably confirm. All right. So he, he, here's the the uh, what the roundabout would will look like. And I apologize if people can't really see this. Uh, maybe I'll try to zoom in a little bit more here if I can find a place to do so. And of course, not not helping me. Um. So the the. You know, where, where there there are not sidewalks proposed at uh, 41 and uh, 926, the the um, uh, there there are no sidewalks in the area, uh, and, and we were not re asked to provide for sidewalks in conjunction with the project by the municipality. Uh, so we're assuming the pedestrians will will use the shoulders and or the lanes uh, to to uh, navigate uh, through the uh, through the intersection. As far as bicyclists and e-bikes, uh, I believe that they would both be treated as vehicles as it would be. Uh, they may be comfortable riding on the shoulders. They might be comfortable riding in the lane. I've seen e I've, I've been in the car and, and, and had e-bikes pass me. Uh, so I know they can go, they can go fast. Um, so it's a, it, it will be a matter of what people would be comfortable with. There are not individual markings uh, for uh pedestrians to, to cross. We don't have uh, uh, any kind of pedestrian walking markings out here. We're, we're not, ex I mean, we're not expecting any. We, we don't know that there's a big, I mean, pedestrians can be part of every roadway and, and, and if they're walking down the shoulder, they would be walking through the shoulder here. But hopefully they will uh, be able to sit back and, and, and walk through this roundabout as safely as possible. If we if we are, do hear concerns, this could be altered to provide for sidewalks, uh, but we, we would need the municipality to be supportive of that kind of a change. All right, so I'll stop sharing my screen there, release related to that. And uh, I apologize, was there more that I was supposed to cover? No, I, I, think that, I think that's very helpful, thank you. Um, and just to follow up, uh, another resident, uh, express something many of us who live closer to Route 1. He's asking, um, uh, uh, is it possible to restrict engine retarders on Route 41, especially into Chatham and uh, from Chatham to Route 1? Tractor trailer noise is a quality of life issue for neighboring residents. I, I would have to get back to you on how that's done. It's, that is not my expertise. I do know that we have a perm, uh, a studies group, uh, and that that has the uh, uh, you know no brake retarders uh, kind of signing. But there's a process to 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 how that would go. I'm just not familiar with it, so I'd have to get somebody from our traffic unit who does that uh, to to kind of 
answer that. Maybe we'll follow up with you and see if we can get a contact person. That, that, that would be fine. Great. And Ricky, uh, would you like to speak directly? I think they're having trouble unmuting. Uh, uh, Ricky, you need to unmute. Kristen, yes, your data was really fascinating and very, very inclusive of Chester County. So my questions are, Chester County is just a small piece of everything. And have you done anything that's more multi-state looking where origins and destinations are? And to go back, and I'm sure you can correct me, but at Perryville at one point when I was working on this, there were eight miles missing that actually connected the East Coast to the West Coast. Has that been uh, resolved? I think it was Norfolk Southern and Amtrak. But, but the, I just think environmentally and economically, we know that rail is the best way to go, if it can. And I understand perishables don't work as well as, they, as others. But is there any study happening to actually address the economics and the environmental issues in a more, you know, multi-state even country? That was a lot to ask. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. No. Let me let me see if I if I miss anything. We can <laughs> remind me. Um, I am not sure about the stretch in Perryville. Um, it doesn't ring a bell to me as a hot topic issue. So I am wondering if it is something that they have closed and completed, especially if it's a Norfolk Southern connection line. Um, but I'm more familiar with their north routes, so I'd have okay. to get back to you. I'm not sure if it's CSO, but check that out because at, and I know Lou Kaplan remembers this, that was, I think it was eight mile stretch, but, but back to the question of looking at the huge picture. I mean, your data was fascinating and so solid, but are we looking at the whole picture and we're looking at it environmentally and economically because it is cheaper for, to use rail. And environmentally is best, so I rest my case. <laughs> I think that, so we, the plan really tries to emphasize that, and these tend to be decisions that are made by private businesses at the end of the day. So incentivizing is, you know, kind of the first tool in the toolkit. Um, in terms of looking at a multi-state rail plan. I do not know of anything that has been done on that level, even really a national level. Um, I know that the rail companies do it for themselves, but that is slightly different. Um, in terms of truck freight planning, that is something where there is a lot more collaboration um, across the region with our neighboring regions. Um, and there are a few different forums that have started to look at that. Um, I will make a plug that we at DVRPC are hoping to do, not hoping, it is in our work program, we will be doing um, a regional truck network analysis um, in the coming year. So kind of taking some of the truck work that we did with this Chester County freight plan and doing that for our entire region taking a more holistic approach to how we are looking at freight um, across the region. But right now we don't have any plans to do that for rail. Um, and in addition, um, there is a group called the, um, it used to be the I-95 coalition. Now they are the Eastern Transportation Coalition. Um, and they have a freight working group. They're not doing any active studies right now, but there are a lot of efforts to collaborate, not just outside of our region, but multi-state Maine down to Florida. And I think it's over to Kentucky now. Um, so I do think that hopefully we might see more of that to come, but right now I don't have anything to point you to in that regard. Well, I thank you so much. And if you'd be interested, I can give you Jim Tripp's contact at Environmental Defense. We spoke about this 15, 20 years ago. 
and I'm sure he's still very involved because it is really something that I hope that we all embrace. Sure, thank I'll be interested. That would be great. Yeah, I'll send it to you. Thank, thank you, Ricky, for those thoughts. Here's for, for Tim, I think. With school buses and emergency vehicles in mind, is there a plan to address roadside washout, particularly where there's no shoulder, to prevent vehicle tip overs, especially when there is snow fall that further obscures visibility on the roadway? Thanks, George. So, so um, I guess what the person's uh, concerned about is ditches or, or, or drainage ditches that are very close to the edge of the pavement. Uh, usually we will not have, uh, if it's a state highway, we, we don't typically have very uh, steep drainage ditches like that. We, they, they should be, I mean, usually uh, our county maintenance forces, when they do what they call shoulder cutting, uh, where they usually have a grade all on uh, running kind of down the shoulder of the road, it will make a, a uh, graded shoulder that, that's, I'll say, consistent with the, the edge of the pavement, right? So if somebody is seeing a location where there are problems, I would encourage you to report it to 1-800-FIX-ROAD uh, to let PennDOT know of a problem that we may not be aware of where erosion has occurred uh, and, and somebody has observed it and, and we've just not caught it or, or had the opportunity to address it so that we get it on our radar and can correct a problem so there's not some kind of a ditch uh, that would create a problem. Great. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Steve. You've answered a couple chat questions, uh, it appears. Uh, I think, uh, does anyone else have a question or comment before we uh, call it an evening? Well, in that, that event, I want to thank our speakers once again, Tim Stevenson, Brian O'Leary, and Kristen Scudder. Mm -hmm. uh, this will be posted uh, over the next week on our website, and we hope to disseminate uh, this fine discussion and also some of the links and especially the two EVRPC freight reports. And with that, I think I will say good night. Hi. Thank you so much for having us. Good, thank you. Good night all. Good night.